Disclaimer. This video is made for informative and entertainment purposes only, and is not to act as a substitute for formal legal advice. Do not use this video or any productions I release for any legal issues you may face. Always consult with a professional lawyer for formal legal advice. You have been warned. Content warning. This video brushes upon the following issues. Sexual assault, pedophilia, violent assault, and gore. You have been warned. Britain, Britain, Britain. The home of the Queen. The place where football nearly came home. And a land riddled with paedophiles? If you've been on Anglo Twitter, or Anglo anything for that matter when it comes to the internet, you may have run across the word called nonce. If you see someone call someone a nonce, the implication is that they are a paedophile. Usually, this allegation carries some obvious weight, but it's also kind of thrown around as a meme. Now, the exact origins of where the word nonce comes from is unknown. The closest I can find to its origins is claimed in an editorial note in a publication called Inside Time, the National Newspaper for Prisoners and Detainees. A brilliant source, I know who released an article in 2018 titled Nonce Myths. I'm not sure how reliable it is as a source. Anyhow, the editorial note reads, The acronym NONCE, N-O-N-C-E, comes from H.M.P. Wakefield at the turn of the century, and was marked on the cell card of any prisoner who may have been in danger of violence from other prisoners. It means, not on normal courtyard exercise, so the staff would not open their doors when other prisoners were out. It makes sense that it could be used for convicted sex offenders, especially paedophiles, since that it is common knowledge that they are far more likely to be on the receiving end of violence from other prisoners due to the severity of their crimes, and who the victims are. It's common to forget that prisoners are human too, and even they rank each other in a hierarchy of hatred, and sex offenders are usually the lowest of the low. Something which has become a thing in the UK of late is nonce stings. A nonce sting is when someone or a group of people confront someone they suspect to be a paedophile. The best way to describe them to Americans especially watching this video is, as my friend Ravion put it, Chris Hansen's How to Catch a Predator on a Budget. Also, please subscribe to Ravion if you haven't already. Usually they have chat logs and it can lead to some moments that have become memes, such as... Don't you start, I'll knock you out clean. Oi. You're gonna do what? So I'm, so, re I'm really, what I'm really did you say? I'm what really did you... Stan said it was it! She was 18, it was on the profile! Don't get angry, don't get angry. No, get now I'm panicking. Yeah, but... Don't panic! No, I am, because I'm gonna lose my job! But my... Fuck me, honestly. Oh, I'm not gonna be doing that right now, mate. Can I just... Yeah, I'll oh, just... Stop. Just... You should have been no, upset I'm yesterday. Be I'm going to be charged. I'm going to be in the cell. You are, yeah. I don't like this. The 14 year old like wouldn't have liked it, eh? Let's not have a balling act. You was here now to meet her. <laughs> you was expect. But how does the law really work around them? How do they lead to a conviction? When addressing these videos, looking at the law is important to understand how it works. The basis in which most of these nonces get caught is under the Sexual Offences Act 2003, specifically sections 10, section 15, and section 15a. There are other laws such as manufacturing of child pornography, however this will take a long time to explain, and not all these people in these videos are suspected of this crime. Anyway, to begin, we look at Section 15 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. Section 15 covers meeting a child following sexual grooming, etc. Reads as 1. A person aged 18 or over, A, commits an offence if A has met or communicated with another person, B, on one or more occasions and subsequently intentionally meets B, A travels with the intention of meeting B in any part of the world, or arranges to meet B in any part of the world, or B travels with the intention of meeting A in any part of the world. A intends to do anything to or in respect of B during or after the meeting mentioned in paragraph A1-3, to and in any part of the world, 
which if done will involve the commission by A of a relevant offence. B is under 16 years old, and A does not reasonably believe that B is 16 or over. So there is a lot to break down here and explain in simpler terms than the law gives. However, as far as legislation goes, it is kind of obvious and straightforward as long as you can follow. Some pieces of legislation don't always have this benefit. What the law is essentially saying is that the perpetrator has to arrange to meet a minor, or someone who he has been talking to, or who he has no reason to believe is over 16. The pronoun he is used as a general term by the way, as this offence can be committed by anyone regardless of their gender identity. The perpetrator can get the victim to travel to them as well and be just as guilty. Reasonableness is a subjective term, but in the context of these offences, it would be made aware that the person the perpetrator is talking to, to their mind, is a minor, usually by a declaration of age. Even when people like the goblin nonce scream, Who did you send it to? Stan said it was a, she was 18, it was on the profile! Don't get angry, don't get angry. No, get it would have been made clear in the chat box that he was talking to someone he believed to be a minor, and therefore would be breaking the law. Section 15 does continue into subsection 2, and reads as follows. In subsection 1, A, the reference to A having met or communicated with B, is a reference to A having met B in any part of the world, or having communicated with B by any means form, to or in any part of the world. Relevant offence means, an offence under this part, anything done outside England and Wales which is not an offence within subparagraph 1, but would be an offence within subparagraph 1 if done in England and Wales. So here the law is saying that the perpetrator has to communicate with the victim or meet them by any means necessary. This means over a phone call, a written letter, online messages, anything really. Using chat logs from instant messaging tends to be the preferred method by predator hunters as it is easier to do, easier to log and quicker to do from the hunter's perspective. Also, in paragraph B3, it makes clear that it doesn't matter where it happens as long as if it is a crime in England or Wales, the person will be found guilty of an offence. Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own criminal law systems, which will be a discussion for another time. The punishment for a crime under section 15 is, on a summary conviction, to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months, or a fine not exceeding the statutory maximum or both, which is £5,000 or on conviction of an indictment to imprisonment of a term not exceeding 10 years. A quick explanation is that a summary conviction is the equivalent of a misdemeanour in the United States. These are your less serious offence where someone will be tried by a magistrate's court, whereas an indictment offence is a crown court trial where you will be tried by a jury. These are similar to the felony charges in the United States. We have a term for this type of offence called triable either way, which means usually depending on the nature of the specific offence by the individual, they will be tried in a respective court of that crime. One thing this does negate to mention is the sex offenders register, which is a register that the police have access to where people convicted of a sexual offence are placed upon, usually based upon the severity of their crimes. I don't want to go too much detail into the sex offenders register, but it's still worth taking into consideration when watching these videos. Section 15A, Sexual Communication with a Child in the Sexual Offences Act 2003, was replaced by Section 67 of the Serious Crime Act 2015. This act inserted itself after 15A, which reads as follows. Sexual Communication with a Child. A person aged 18 or over, A, commits an offence if, for the purpose of obtaining sexual gratification, A intentionally communicates with another person, B, the communication is sexual or is intended to encourage B to make, whether to A or to another, a communication that is sexual, and B is under 16 and A does not reasonably believe that B is 16 or over. For the purposes of this section, a communication is sexual if, any part of it relates to sexual activity, or a reasonable person would, in all the circumstances, but regardless of anyone's purpose, consider any part of the communication to be sexual. And in paragraph A, sexual activity means an activity that a reasonable person would, in all the circumstances, but regardless of any person's purpose, consider to be sexual. The punishment for this crime is on a summary conviction to imprisonment of a term not exceeding 12 months, or a fine, or both. 
or on a conviction on indictment to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years. Here the law is stating that there needs to be a conversation of a sexual nature, regardless if it was the intention of the conversation, but if it did turn sexual to what a reasonable person would consider it to be, then it's a crime. So it may sound a little confusing in a way, however, if there are sexual references and the perpetrator either encourages them or engages with them if the victim began it, then they are guilty of the crime. Now the age may become a bit of a sticking point for some people, but the law states that it has to be a minor or the person has to believe that the person they're talking to is under 16 for there to be a crime. So, in short, there has to be something which indicates a sexual communication or something that makes the reasonable person to believe there is a sexual communication taking place and the person engaging in the sexual communication, one of the people is a minor or the perpetrator believes that person to be under the age of 16. As the act states, the victim is under 16 and the accused does not reasonably believe they are 16 or over, so how do these nonce things lead to a conviction when these decoys are adults? Well, the concept in criminal law known as mens rea, which is Latin for guilty mind, is part of the criminal law equation. So, when a person engages with someone who is an adult but they believe to be a minor, that's where the law has broken place, because in the perpetrator's mind, they are communicating with a child and not an adult, so it doesn't matter if that person is an adult or not. As you may have heard in these videos, they mention the chat logs a lot, and this is where they get most of these nonsense convicted. When the communication is down in writing, and there is a declaration of age, it makes conviction rather simple, and makes it difficult for the paedophiles to argue against it. Moving on to section 10 of the act, which is far more sinister, so consider this a late warning to the type of conduct which will be discussed, since it is very explicit and sexual in nature. I will give a brief pause in case you want to stop listening now and close the video. Without further delay, section 10 reads as a person aged 18 or over, A, commits an offence if he intentionally causes or incites another person, B, to engage in activity, the activity is sexual and either B is under 16 and A does not reasonably believe that B is 16 or over, or B is under 13. A person guilty of an offence under this section, if the activity caused or incited involved, penetration of B's anus or vagina, penetration of B's mouth with a person's penis, penetration of a person's anus or vagina with a part of B's body, or by B with anything else, or penetration of a person's mouth with B's penis. As I said, this is a rather explicit and disgusting part of the law. The easiest way to describe this crime is that the perpetrator has encouraged the victim to engage in this activity. This does not mean the perpetrator themselves has penetrated the victim in this case, as that would amount to a charge of rape and or assault by penetration, sections 1 and 2 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 respectively. But this is when a perpetrator encourages the victim, who is a minor, to engage in sexual conduct, including penetration as stated above. When people in these non-stings encourage minors to engage in these acts, it is a clear violation of section 10 subsection 2. As I did pre-warn you, it's something which is very disgusting to even discuss. The punishment for section 10 can be a prison term for up to 14 years if it is an indictable offence. If subsection 2 applies, it could also be up to 14 years on an indictable offence, or up to 6 months and a level 5 fine, which is £5,000. So, why did I make this video? I wanted to show people what these people are actually engaging in, and to highlight how severe it is. These people who have all received convictions are usually talking to a decoy, which some people use in their defence. However, these people believe they are communicating with actual children, which will waive any claims to entrapment or duress as I have previously explained. It is important to understand the why and how to be clear exactly of what these people are being convicted of, since some of the charges are incredibly serious and the conduct is alarmingly disgusting. Outside of the memes, I do find these videos a little gross, which may upset some paedophile hunters, and I really struggle to form an opinion on this type of action either way. I appreciate people feeling concerned and want to do something about it, however, there have been incidents which have gone drastically wrong. Also, the whole filming of it, whilst understandable to do to make sure there is no violence or coercion, and to make sure the evidence can be admitted in a court of law, is where I find the grossness of these videos, especially live streams. We have to remember these people are still innocent till they are proven guilty, 
By live streaming it, there is effectively a tar and feathering of someone before they have been to court to defend themselves. Sure, in most cases these people are guilty. Most will tend to plead guilty due to the overwhelming evidence against them. However, that is something for the courts to decide, not really social media. I also fear that many paedophile hunters may be putting themselves in harm's way. There is a video of one of these non-stings where the accused paedophile bit a part of a man's finger off and it couldn't be recovered, meaning that man is permanently scarred by this person. The accused got 10 years imprisonment as a result of his crimes, which included the wounding with intent, grievous bodily harm charge, a very serious charge indeed, since the punishment can be up to life imprisonment. In addition, there have been some groups who lure in suspected paedophiles, blackmail them with the evidence they have on them, and violently assault them. Furthermore, the police have issued out multiple warnings before, such as when five paedophile hunters were arrested under suspicion of false imprisonment. So, whilst in a way it is a good thing we have these groups seeking out paedophiles, I'm not sure confronting the accused is the best choice, certainly not in the manner they are going about it. The exploitation of children, especially online by strangers, is a serious concern we should all take seriously. However, vigilantes ought to hand their findings to the police instead of streaming it online, no matter how funny the bored nonce clips are. Simple as. Now I'm panicking. Yeah, Don't panic. No, I am because I'm going to lose my job. 